Okay, we are continuing with our study on Paul's declaration of the gospel. Um, I have this, this outline is, is titled 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, and we passed verse 8 a long time ago. Um, and we're down to the section now of verses 20 through 23. Last week we spent a good deal of time dealing on Paul's um, argument, uh, logical argument about how it is that Christ had to be risen because if he wasn't, or if his argument that, that, that there is a resurrection because if there isn't a resurrection then Christ isn't risen and if Christ isn't risen then we're still in our sins. This week we're going to see that Paul confidently affirms the resurrection of Christ and the future resurrection of those that are in Christ. Um, verses 20 through 23. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Now Paul says that Christ is now risen from the dead. The current status that Paul is talking about here is that Christ is still risen that he's still alive, that he, he is risen from, the, not that he was, that he is risen from the dead. Now there were, there were a number of people looking at the scripture that had been resurrected before, that had risen from the dead. Lazarus was one of them. You remember Christ called to him, Lazarus come forth and he came out of the, came out of the grave. Um, at, at the time of the crucifixion, there were multitudes of people that were risen from the dead, but see, they all died again. They, they might have been risen from the dead, but they, did, they weren't there forever. They were only there for a time and then they died again. Christ didn't die again, and that's the point. That's why when we see reference to him being the firstborn or the first fruits, he's the first that was raised in this sense. Yes, there were others that had been raised. There was the little boy that uh, um, that Elijah raised from the dead. There was the, there was the, the, the boy that had fallen out of the balcony when Paul was preaching that Paul raised from the, so there were, there are numerous cases of people being raised, but, but not, not to immortality. They were raised again, but they went on, they went on to die. Christ hasn't died again. And that's an important point. Christ's dead body was raised immortal. Now, immortal means not mortal, not liable or subject to death, deathless, undying, living forever. Someone that is immortal they don't possess the thing within them that will kill them like we do. See, we're born with a with a, a nature that eventually we're not going to live forever. We're going to this body's going to fall over dead someday. Um, but if you were raised immortal, then you don't have that thing within you that will cause you to eventually die, and that's the situation that that, that Christ is in. And and his immortality is a central part of the gospel. Look over to Acts chapter thirteen. In verse 32, Acts 13, 32. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another Psalm, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. 
but he whom God raised again saw no corruption. So Christ's immortality is essential to the, to the, to, to the gospel. He was raised to no more return to corruption. And Paul demonstrated that according to the scriptures, um, that Christ's resurrection was to immortality. Okay? <clears throat> and we will remember that in this, own, in this passage, when he, was, when he talked about um, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, earlier on in verse 4, that he was buried and then he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's a central part of this. Um, and in Romans chapter 6 and verse 9, it says that knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Now, why is that important? You'll see as we move on. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, Revelation 1 and verse 18, Christ speaking says, I am he that liveth and was dead. You see, liveth present tense, was des, dead past tense. That argues a resurrection right there. I used to be dead, but I'm not anymore. I'm alive. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. So the fact that he lives now and was dead declares his resurrection. And that he is alive forevermore declares his immortality. If Christ Jesus ever dies again, it will nullify all of his claims and everything he ever did. Okay. Um, now, we're told that he's the first fruits of them that slept. Look over at Acts chapter 26. Acts 26, 23. Look at verse 22 just to get context. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. This is Paul speaking. Witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than, than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. See, that's an interesting point, that Moses and the prophets had prophesied about Christ coming into the world. And they prophesied about what would happen when Christ did come into the world. And that was, that's what Paul was always arguing. When he was going into the synagogues and arguing, he wasn't, he wasn't preaching the New Testament as we are. It hadn't been written yet. He was going back into the Old Testament and showing how the Old Testament prophets had prophesied of exactly what was going to happen. That's one of the interesting things about prophecy and something that we need to hold on to. Prophecy is not given so that you can sit back and predict the future. That's not, what it's, that's not the reason for it. The reason for prophecy is that so it, when it's fulfilled, you can look back at it and see how the fulfillment actually came to pass. And as a result of that, you can see that the prophecy was true. It's not given so that you can say, well, this is going to happen in the future. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We'll find out when we get there. And when we get there, then we can look back at those prophetic books and see, oh, that's how that lines up. I'll give you an example. Over in the book of Daniel, I'm going to chase a rabbit for a minute. Over in the book of Daniel, there, there's a prophecy given um, that where Daniel describes to Nebuchadnezzar this these different world empires that were going to come into being. And he describes Babylon and Medio Persian or Meta Persian and, and Greece and Rome and then the church which comes and destroys all of them. That's, those, are in a, those are in a prophecy. Now, if you lived at the time, during the time of Daniel, you wouldn't be able to see who was coming next. You'd know somebody was coming, but you wouldn't know who. How would you know who? He didn't tell you. But then as history unfolded itself 
and you look at those prophecies and you look at the characteristics of those prophecies, they match perfectly with what history has told us. You can look back now and see exactly who that was. You couldn't have seen it looking forward, okay? So, so here, that's what, that's what Paul's saying. Um, that what he was preaching was nothing other than what the prophets had said would come. And in verse 23, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Well, how is he first? There were a lot of people that were risen from the dead before him. Well, he's the first that was risen immortal, risen to immortality. Um, and being the first fruits of them that slept, that declares that those who slept will also rise as he did. He's the first fruit of those who slept. Um, look at John chapter 14. In verse 19, John 14 and verse 19. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall also live. You see, the resurrection of Christ guarantees the resurrection of us. The fact that he's risen guarantees that all of those for whom he died will rise also. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians 4, 14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. So that's the problem. The fact that Christ rose as the first, if you're the first fruits, there's got to be second fruits, right? Or there'd be no reason to call it first fruits. If you're the first that's been risen, well, there has to be a second. Or why use the word first? So Christ was the first that was risen this way. We will be the second, and that will happen at the resurrection. Um, when we talk about those that, um, that will raise, look, look at 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now this is an interesting point. You know, these passages are used constantly by those that want to teach the idea of a rapture, and yet this verse proves there can't be one. It absolutely, by the, by the primary meaning of the word prevent, it proves there cannot be a rapture of live people before the resurrection of the dead, which happens at the last day. It absolutely proves it. You say, well, how is that, Pastor? Well, the, the primary meaning, remember, we define words by their primary meanings, right? The primary meaning of the word prevent, pre, which means before, vent, or meaning event, something before another event, it means it go before or precede. Okay, now look at the look at the at the verse based on that definition. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, go before, 
precede happened before them which were asleep. The resurrection comes before those of us that are still alive at the time are changed and caught up to meet Christ in the air. Therefore, there can't be a situation where we get out of here early without and leave those behind. And that's what Paul is arguing. We don't get out of here and leave the dead in the ground. No, the dead in Christ rise first. Continue to read on. For, the, for, for the, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay? So the promise... Because Christ was resurrected and is still alive, there's the promise that we will be resurrected and will live with him in paradise forever. He's also called a couple of other things. Over in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18... Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So he's known as the firstborn from the dead. He's also in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. Revelation 1, 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto them that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So he's the first begotten of the dead. He's the first born from the dead. And in Hebrews chapter 6, he's the forerunner. Hebrews chapter 6 Verses 19 and 20. Which hope we have as an, as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> so all this declares that those who sleep in Jesus will rise from the dead and enter heaven the same way that Christ did. And this fulfilled the type that was set forth over in Moses' law in Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23, verses 9 through 11. We read, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now that's the feast. Um, I forget which one that one's called. Um, the Feast of Pentecost. That's the, there were four feasts that the, the Jewish men had to attend to. This is the one right after Passover. This is the feast right after Passover, okay? And where the, what's oh, the feast of first fruits? It's, it's when, when they wave the first, the sheaf of the first fruits uh, before the high priest for the people. It follows the feast of Passover and unleavened bread, which portrayed Christ putting away our sins, okay? 
in the same chapter, Leviticus 23, only in verses 5 through 8, we have, we have those feasts. Um, Leviticus 23, verse 5, In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile, servile work therein. That's Passover. Now, you know, this answers some problems that some folks have with this idea that Christ was crucified, had to get, had to get him down off the cross before the Sabbath, which is true. And so they come to the conclusion that he must have been crucified on a Friday and, and, and rose on, Saturday, on Sunday morning, which is obviously true if you read the scripture. But not the Friday to Sunday morning part. He rose after three days. We looked at that verse just a couple of minutes ago. The one sign that he gave that he was the Messiah was that he would be in the ground three days and three nights. And I don't care what kind of common core math you want to use. You can't get three days and three nights out of Friday afternoon to Sunday morning. You can't do it. This answers the problem. You see, folks, whenever these feasts rolled around, those days were considered the same as the Sabbath. So at all of these different feasts, you had multiple Sabbaths during those weeks. In this case, you had... You had one on the first day, then you had the weekly Sabbath, then you had another one on the seventh day, then you had another weekly Sabbath. So within two weeks' time, you had four different Sabbaths. So it, it makes perfect sense then when you consider that Christ was crucified before one of these high holy day Sabbaths and was in the ground and rose the day after the weekly Sabbath. Um, now, to tie this stuff, to look at, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm, I'm going to actually tie these feasts together in a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. Where Paul says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that it may be a new lump for as... Uh, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In these feasts that we were just looking at, you had the feast of Passover and unleavened bread, followed by the feast of first fruits. That feast, when it, was, when it was waved, that was the day after the Sabbath. So when you consider that the sheaf of the first fruits was presented on the morrow after the Sabbath, Christ was presented to God on the morrow after the Sabbath. Passover first, there's the sacrifice. First fruits representing the resurrection second, and Christ and the, and the first fruit offering accepted the morrow after the Sabbath. You see how that ties together? You see, these, these, those feasts pictured Jesus Christ and what he was going to do looking back at them. Now, that wouldn't have made any sense to anybody looking forward, would it? You wouldn't see that connection at all if you were just standing there looking forward and didn't know what Christ was going to do or how it was going to happen or when it was going to happen or any of that. But looking back at it, it makes sense. Um, look at Mark chapter 1. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 16 and verse 1. Mark 16 and verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, 
Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came under the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. You see, the morning the mor after the Sabbath. That was when Christ was raised and one of the things that he did was presented himself to God at that time. Look at, um, um, where am I here? Look at verse nine. Now, when Jesus was risen early, the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. So you see, he was raised, and he, after that, he presented himself. Um, so the sheaf was weighed before the Lord to be accepted for the people. And the risen Christ pre presented himself before God and is accepted for his people. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. In verse 24. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So the first fruit is accepted by God for us the same way that the first fruit sheaf was accepted for the people in the Old Testament days. Look also at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he, that's God, hath made us accepted in the beloved, that's Christ. Now another point that I want to make, and that is that by man has come both death and the resurrection of the dead. We'll go back to our passage again. Verse 21, 1 Corinthians 15, 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Now, Paul had just affirmed the resurrection of Christ. And since Christ is a man, we're told that in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, by man comes the resurrection of the dead. It wouldn't do, see in order to pay, the sin, pay for the sins, or the price for the sins of the people, it wouldn't do, do to sacrifice something that hadn't sinned, would it? See, man is the one that, cr that created the problem. Therefore, man is the one that has to pay the price for the problem. Killing sheep doesn't do any good relative to sin. Because sin, or sheep, didn't eat of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. They're not the ones that caused the problem. If they had to cause the problem, then they're the ones that would have to pay the price. But no, man did that. I, I just pictured that little picture of I did that. We should have Adam in that one, right? Um, man's the one that committed the sin. Man's the one that caused the problem. Therefore, man had to pay the price for the problem. Um, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for, all, for that all have sinned. That's how it got in here. That's how death was introduced. It was by Adam. So it was necessary that a man die for our sins if we're going to be saved from death. 
You can kill sheep and goats and bulls all you want to, but that's not going to pay the price for man. It might pay the price for sheep and goats and bulls, but not man. A man had to pay that price. Hebrews chapter 2. Unfortunately, if we tried to pay the, well, there will be folks that will pay and will end up paying that price. Um, those that were not, that are not in the salvation by Jesus Christ will pay that price. They'll pay the price of death. But in order to pay the price, the debt is so huge that you can suffer for eternity and still owe at the end of it. And that's what eternal punishment is. Is That's why. That's the purpose for it. That's why, why if you end up there, you end up there forever. Because you'll pay forever and still owe on the debt. Worse than owing to the IRS. Interest rate's insane. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. That's interesting, isn't it? He didn't take on the seed of Adam. I wonder why he didn't take on the seed of Adam. Well, because he didn't take on the seed of the entire human race. He took on himself the seed of Abraham, the chosen people. That's the seed, that's who he died for. He paid the price for them. He didn't pay the price for everybody. He paid the price for God's elect children. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So the man Christ Jesus, having put away our sins by his death, rose from the dead, thus undoing the effect of sin. Remember, the effect of sin is death. Well, he undid that. By paying the ultimate price, he undid that, and he did it for us. So by man, a human being with a flesh body, has come the resurrection of the dead. A human being with a flesh body caused the problem to start with, and a human being with a flesh body solved the problem. Job asked in Job 14, 14, if a man dies, shall he live again? And 1 Corinthians 15, 21 answers uh, resoundingly, yes, he shall. We're also told here that in Adam all die. Back in Romans. Now, when, we're, when we talk about, in Romans 5, 12, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. That, the, this death, the death that we're talking about here, we're not talking about the spiritual side of it. We're talking about the physical side of it. There's a spiritual death that all mankind has dealt with. Then there's a physical death that is a result of that. And so what we're talking about right now is that physical death. Do you follow me on that? Because your spiritual resurrection happens in this life and the new birth. Your physical resurrection happens at the end of time. So we're not talking about the spiritual resurrection, which is the new birth. That has already happened. I'm assuming for everyone in the room that's a member here. 
the resurrection of our bodies, the physical part of it, is what we're talking about. So, so let's not confuse the two deaths. Um, So the death under consideration is the, is the body. And this subject was introduced in the beginning of the chapter when Paul first presented the death, the burial, burial and the resurrection of Christ's human body, uh, which he proceeds, that's what he proceeds to build the reasoning on. Um, we go back here to the, to chap, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and was buried, and that ro he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You see, we're talking about the, the physical the physical sides of, the, of things. And that verb die is in the present tense. Um, human bodies are presently dying. You've been dying since the day you were born. Each day that goes by, you die a little bit more until finally you, death wins out and you have more death than you got life and that's the, and that's the end. Um, and even our living bodies, they're in the process of dying. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our inward man perish, yet the, in, though our outward man, I'm sorry, our outward man perish, this body that we've got, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day, but the outward man, the flesh, the bot, it's, it's dying. And it's been dying from the very get-go. Um, and we see it constantly taking place all around us. And the death of the human body results from Adam's sin. That's what caused death to begin with. Had Adam not sinned in the Garden of Eden, you see, Adam was made immortal also, but he sinned, causing himself to die and everybody in his family to die right along with him. Look back at Genesis chapter 17, or Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. And unto Adam, this is after the sin, unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Ever since Adam sinned, it's been, the graveyard has been the place we're all headed eventually. We've got a little bit of time before then, but we're all headed in that direction. And another point, and we find this over the first place we find it over in Romans chapter 5. You say, well, so what? If Adam, if Adam sinned, how does that affect me? Just because this guy back in the Garden of Eden, he did something wrong, why does that affect me? Um, well, the easy answer is that when God gave the commandment to Adam, he saw the entire human race in Adam. We were all there. Now, this is probably a bad analogy, but um, one of the things I found out when I first started having chickens 
was that when a hen is born, and I didn't know women are the same way, that when a hen is born, every egg that that hen will ever lay is already present within the, the body of that chicken. They're all there. And it's the same with women. Every egg that they have is already there to be released however that happens to work. Well, God saw that the entire human race was in Adam at the time that he sinned. The same type of thing. Now, um, I mean, if you take every family and all of them, add them all up, we're all there. He saw all of us. So when Adam sinned, it affected everybody that was in his bloodline from the time that he lived until the end of time. That's everyone. With, and the only reason that Jesus Christ didn't have sin was because Adam wasn't Jesus Christ's father. God was. In Romans chapter 5, in verse, beginning of verse 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. Now that all men in both of those cases is all men to whom it applies. In Adam's case, it applies to every human being without exception. In Christ's case, it, re it uh, uh, refers to all of those that apply to that, all of those that are in Christ. Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now, let me show you, show you this principle in another, in another passage. If we look over at Hebrews chapter 7, you will remember that Abraham gave tithes Hebrews chapter 7. You will remember that Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek when he met him. Melchizedek, the king of Salem, who was a priest of God, and Abraham gave a tithe, 10% of what he had as a result of the wars, to, to Melchizedek. Okay? In verse, uh, verse 1, for this Melchizedek king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So we see Abraham giving tithes to Melchizedek. Um, now, look at verses 9 and 10. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. You say, well, what in the world does that mean? Who's Levi? Well, Levi is one of Abraham's grandchildren. Isaac. Great-grandchildren. Levi is one of the sons of Jacob. So you've got Abraham, then you've got Isaac, then you've got Jacob, and then you've got the 12 sons of Jacob, one of them being Levi. He's the great-grandson of Abraham. He is seen as paying tithes to Melchizedek in Abraham, even though it was four generations away before he was even going to be born. You see, that's the point. God recognized, recognizes all of us in this process so that when Adam sinned he took down the entire human race with him Let me get back to my passage again OK, 
Okay, so verse 21, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, even so in the same manner, in the same manner that all men died as a result of what Adam did, then they will be made alive by the result of what Christ did. So let me ask you a question. How many of you went to Adam and begged him to be a sinner? Anybody? Any of you ever go and ask for Adam to be your father so that you could then be his? No, you became a sinner by what he did. And you become righteous by what Jesus Christ did, not by what you do. In the same manner, this, both of these happen. You become a sinner because of the action of somebody. You become righteous because of the action of somebody, not because of your own actions. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. See, one of the things we need to, we need to remember is that this death, we're not going to escape that. If we live here long enough and the Lord delays his coming, every one of us is going to end up dead eventually. Some later than others. But that's a fact as a result of what Adam did. So that's not our hope. Our hope is not that we're going to live here forever on this planet. Our hope is that we're going to live somewhere else. Our hope is that we're going to re be resurrected to something better. Because it's, it's, a, it's a fact that we're not going to be here. The idea of trying to extend our life way beyond what we should a bit, we're still going to eventually die. That can't, that's not our hope. It's in vain to hope that we're not going to die in this world. We're going to. Bad might be bad news, I hate to tell you, but that's a fact. If the Lord delays his coming, every one of us is going to die. Whatever you do, whatever plans you make, we're not going to live here forever. We're going to eventually die. That's not our hope. Our hope is the future resurrection of the body out of death at Christ's second coming. That's the blessed hope that Titus spoke of over in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Titus 2, 13. Looking for that blessed hope. That's it. The blessed hope is not that we're going to live forever here. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our hope. And we are waiting patiently for a home that we don't presently see. The redemption of our bodies. Romans chapter 8. Verses 23 through 25. Romans chapter 8, 23 through 25. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what uh, a man seeth, why doth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And that's the hope that we're looking for. That someday Christ will return 
and we'll be resurrected into a much better state. Now, while it's true every man's going to rise, going to rise from the dead, what we're looking at is the resurrection of Christ, or of, of those that are in Christ, and that's the topic that we're that we're discussing, and that's where we're going to pick up again next week, Lord willing. Um, and we're gonna, we'll look briefly at the end result of those that aren't in Christ, but we but really. Are we really concerned with that? You know, sometimes one of the things that we have to remember in this, we need to be more concerned about ourselves than we need to be concerned about everybody else. Being concerned about everybody else does nothing but get you, but get you in trouble. It always, you start worrying about other people and you get yourself in trouble. There's a, there's a story, I've told this before, I'll, I'll tell it again, about a, a young girl that went to the preacher one time and said, um, I, I'm sorry, but I have to leave the church. And the preacher said, well, can I ask why? Well, yeah, because, you know, during the preaching, everybody's checking their Facebook status and they're, you know, they're texting with this person or they're doing this or they're checking emails or they're doing... They're, they're not paying any attention to the service. And so the, the pastor said, well, listen, I'll, I'll tell you what, take, take this glass of water. Let's pour it all the way up to the top. I want you to take this. I want, to, want you to walk all the way around the sanctuary with this. And then when you get back to me, tell me what you, what you found. And so she walks all the way around the sanctuary. And he gets back and said, how many people did you see checking their Facebook status? None. How many people were sending emails. None. I didn't see any of them. Why? Because I was concentrated on not spilling any of the water. And that's the point. Let's concentrate on what we can do. Let's quit worrying so much about what other people do. Let's pay attention to us. Because in the end, we're the only ones that can have any, any evidence at all to ourselves of whether or not there is a resurrection at the end that's going to be good. We're the only ones that can get any of that kind of assurance. You're not going to get it because of somebody else. You're going to get it from your own actions and how you live your life. That's the important, the important thing. And we'll deal with some of that again, as, as, Lord willing, next week when we come back. But for today, let's, uh, let me say that I thank you for your kind and patient attention. Let's, let's stand this morning and be dismissed in prayer.